Hello everyone and uh, welcome to our first person in touch event. <laughs> that is uh, um, it's like a concept so I will I, I try to appear a bit in, in camera too. <laughs> so it's like uh, not really only oriented to the touch designer but um, first we go over different artists working with touch designer so it was a bit of wordplay that we can touch the person, <laughs> but also it's person who work in touch designer. And uh, first, uh, I've decided to use the possibility that Marcus is in Berlin and can manage to come to my studio. And uh, I invited him because I really inspired from him, like from person, from the artist, from technical director. Uh, we were used to work together first time, I think it was for Christopher Bauder's White Void, uh, mm -hmm. the great installation. Great also here yeah, we were prepa preparing for performance uh, for Leon's, uh, how was called it? Nuit Blanche. Nuit Blanche, yeah, like yeah. Uh, White Night of Light yep. in Leon, and we were sitting in frozen warehouse uh, here in Lichtenberg. Mm -hmm. in Berlin preparing uh, I was learning to make uh, the control of moving heads and touch designer and Marcus was finishing his amazing piece of software developed for white void mm -hmm. and finalizing working with his moving control uh, yeah fixtures that was a good uh, I do remember a very cold that was super cold that was just uh, like a gas heater yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, this uh, like weapon, mm -hmm. <laughs> looking like uh, like a weapon, <laughs> and uh, I was burned my uh, clothes, I think, on that thing <laughs> because it was too cold. So I was like closer <laughs> to that. It was good, yeah. No, yeah, exactly. That's uh, seven years ago or so, I think. I think it was more. It was 2013. Oh wow! That Holy. was my first project in, Ber in Berlin. So right. I just oh. moved to 2013. Yeah. And then it was over Isabel. She wrote me that if I would have a fun to work with, mm -hmm. so that she provided the connection, and then we met for the first yeah. time. Wow, that's been a while. Holy, have you been back to the space, uh, to the white void space now? Yes, uh, recently it was a performance on my friend who is doing a fashion design, mm -hmm. uh, Cyberesque. Mm -hmm. and she was uh, celebrating 15 years of her fashion brand uh, and it was a fashion performance inside of Bowder's installation. Oh, nice. It was really funny because Bowder was like really like a god with all the black eyes and black clothes yeah. together <laughs> with all the god people. <laughs> what kind of like Bergheim god yep. community. Yep. <laughs> That's fitting, yeah. Well, white void. It says it all. Yep, nice. And uh, my idea was uh, to present Marcus' artistic work because I think everyone was looking to and sync to his YouTube tutorials on Touch Designer and all these presentations in mm -hmm. Node Institute and whatever. But uh, I disc actually I seen sometimes uh, his performances and. Uh, it's very interesting to speak about your artistic uh, story mm -hmm. because I mean everyone knows you from one side and that's not so much materials about your artistic career mm -hmm. and I like your style I really like uh, the Thanks. concepts behind uh, so what you were showing to that uh, not institute performance where I also was so I was hearing to your speech mm -hmm. detailed mm -hmm. and it's very interesting so I would uh, give a mic to you and offer you to tell a bit the story how how it sure. all became with Alva Noto, with your work, with yeah. uh, Mark Tibido, with... Uh, it's a, yeah, it's a long... it all basically started also in... Uh, kind of started in Berlin as well. Uh, I was studying in Ilmenau, small town close to Erfurt. Mm -hmm. And then regularly, that was like in the 90s, late 90s, and I regularly was in Berlin for... Uh, um, like the summer break in university working for different agencies here mm -hmm. and one agency was uh, um, and at the time uh, Ilmenau had a virtual studio like a broadcast ready virtual studio uh -huh. okay, okay. So there was that a lot sense. of mm -hmm. equipment there um, I didn't necessarily did get to use that but uh, people were doing a lot of visuals 
at parties with the equipment that was available. Uh -huh. um, but it was mostly uh, video mashups, kind of. Mm -hmm. and I always thought that uh, video, I always liked more of the uh, uh, creating from nothing so that you're not, uh, that you're not always faced with pictures or images that you recognize from advertising or um, like that was what people mostly used right for traditional VJing you use videos video clips and stuff like this so at some point here in Berlin I was working for a company and we were doing uh, multimedia CD-ROMs for I had the same experience in Russia in <laughs> <laughs> the late 90s really, like, yeah and using director, Macromedia director for that, uh -huh. uh, which had the Lingo scripting language, um, a precursor to uh, action script in, in Flash. Flash. Um, and this Lingo language let you already um, affect images on a pixel basis. Mm -hmm. And then there was this guy, oh, shit, no, obviously, Monitor Automatic. He was part of Monitor Automatic here in Berlin, a VJ team as well. Mm -hmm. They always played, or they were regulars at uh, BMF, a club back then. Currently transformed into a big, close to Oranienburger Straße, uh -huh. in the old postal office there. Um, that's now a condo. It's uh, Dachilis, near the Dachilis somewhere. On the other side, ah, yeah, uh -huh. basically on the other side. And uh, he worked at the same company for a project as well, and he kind of got me uh, through conversations he got me going on trying to use director for video uh, so because they developed their own tools as well for that and um, then a couple years later a friend of mine Jörg Unterberg he went to San Francisco for an internship and came back with a newspaper or a magazine 3D World with a tiny little article about this big about touch designer uh -huh. there. And there was a touch designer nine or whatever. Um, and I just decided to, because there was a generative approach then, it was already marketed there as a generative um, real time 3D uh, software. Um, and so I decided to just do an internship there because that was the only way for me to afford the software because the software was way too expensive for me to get to. Uh, so I thought, okay. Uh, only way to use this is by doing an internship um, and then uh, just arrived in Toronto and learned basically touch designer um, some of which the results of that is still available if you go to the wiki and look for touch art 17 uh -huh. then um, not, it doesn't really run anymore this software but it's uh, there you can get a lot of the uh, early synths that were made in touch 13 touch 9 or even earlier uh, touch 17 some of that stuff is from me as well so I learned basically there how to do visuals with uh, real-time 3d um, and uh, that was a good start but then I also contacted through a I don't know how that actually happened but I was in a forum somehow in Toronto and was we were back then using this MX uh, 50 mixer, mm -hmm. big Panasonic MX50 mixer. So when doing visuals with Greg at, and Ben was also doing visuals at the moment, Ben uh, Folk, Void. Uh -huh. um, when we would be doing these visuals there, we would be lugging big computers, CRT monitors, um, VGA to S video converters that then connected into the Panasonic MX50 mixer. And then we would be doing visuals with that, basically. Is that analog mixer? Analog mixer, yeah. Um, and that got me looking for those kind of mixers. And I found that the MX-10 Panasonic mixer also had a smaller, smaller, um, but was able to do this. And in a forum, I found uh, Stefan Kraus, um, well known through the Node Institute here in mm -hmm. Berlin. And he had a, or he still has this uh, MX-10. Ah, that's why. Collective. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, what I really liked about them was that they were using just a feedback loop in the mixer. Uh -huh. So, And the idea that you have an instrument, which is the mixer, and you have to play it, otherwise it whites out. Uh -huh. So it's a constant 
a fully generative approach, basically. Um, so I contacted him uh, after the internship, went back to Ilmenau. Um, Stefan Kraus was teaching at Bauhaus at the time. So I decided to switch from Ilmenau to Bauhaus to get closer, basically, to Stefan. Uh, and then learned a lot from him about VJing in general. And he uh, booked me for a couple of gigs there, which was fun. Um, then uh, Greg got back to me and um, asked me if I want to do a tour with a rock band, um, go on, like, on a big tour. And uh, I kind of knew of them before because Derivative had done visuals for this rock band when I did my internship there. Uh, there was Rush, um, this uh i don't know is, <laughs> does rush make is that a do you know rush did you rush no 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 it's a rock band oh uh, okay no I, <laughs> maybe we can look uh is there internet yeah, yeah i can uh, open the browser uh, uh, so like here yeah so if we look for a uh, rush rush r30 uh yeah this tour here I basically did uh, was on tour with this band, a three piece band. Um, and they for the previous tour as well, they were already using real time visuals, mm -hmm. all touch designer for it, which is pretty pretty amazing. This is their thirtieth anniversary tour. I'm not sure if you can see any of the you can kind of see the screen set up there that was, but there's no good. Uh, no good picture of the visuals there. Anyway, so those were made. Um, oh yeah, there, right. A little bit. Uh, oh yeah. Oh, nice. It's even. It's, a, uh, it's, it's on our page. <laughs> uh, yeah. So. Um, all of these visuals here, they were created by Jared Smith, by Ben. Uh, void by Greg and uh, Farah Yusuf as well um, and basically I was hired to oh that's me right here um, I was basically hired to perform those live during this uh, big tour around the US uh, Canada and Europe mm -hmm. uh, it was a little bit intimidating because you have to do this in front of a fairly large crowd uh, I think there's like 20, 30,000 people in these Ooh. outdoor arenas. Um, lots of equipment. We had three laptops, two were running in parallel so that uh, we could switch between, since you cannot, uh, couldn't crossfade or anything. Uh -huh. So you had to run the first synth and then the other synth on another computer and then so on. Um, you see all these uh, monitors here to check the signal, the colors are correct, uh, stuff like that. Um, yeah, so I got a little bit uh, working on a, in a live environment there and on the side just developing my own stuff. Now, I didn't really know Rush, uh, not a rock person myself, um, and uh, but I thought, okay, before rock is done, kind of, this is <laughs> an excellent chance to go on a on a real tour um, in a bus with a band. <laughs> kind of, uh, as an East German, this uh, American, I don't know, like it, it transposed basically from one culture into another. It was yeah, interesting. Like in cinema, yeah. <laughs> yeah, totally. I really enjoyed this actually because you get to travel with the. Uh, you get to travel with the whole crew and those are all professional touring people and I'm just like Ugh, I don't know what this is uh, for me it was more like observing um, uh, observing the whole scene like interactions and how that works they lots of stories from them because they would be touring not just with Rush but they would be touring with all kinds of other any band basically they switch around it was super interesting um, and you get to go around all of US there were 50 I think it was 50 shows in the US um, 
you don't necessarily see much because you always end up outside of cities and then you arrive set mm -hmm. up do the show and leave again but it was still super interesting to do um and um yeah going back to i mean uh i basically just worked my way through to creating visuals, uh, doing club visuals. Um, after the show, I moved back to Leipzig, my hometown. Um, then there had a VJ collective, so to speak, uh, Farbraum Lenkungsaktiv. Um, color, space, coordination committee, I guess that would be the translation, uh, where we did just shows in clubs. Uh, You've seen that uh, Berlin uh, DJ named generator. <laughs> it's like oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. all this yeah. <laughs> insane combination of <laughs> strange words. It's, uh, it literally comes from that. There was uh, back then that was totally inspired by names like Giraffentoast or stuff like this, a Hamburg VJ crew, or in Berlin here, um, uh, what's the name? Uh, they do a lot of the B pitch stuff. Uh, I'll remember again. Anyway, yeah, so totally inspired by this. But so we did basically club visuals and did a couple of things with uh, with musicians also, like uh, classical musicians, mm -hmm. trying to do put them into a certain scenography and then do uh, music with them while they perform. Uh, he was performing. This guy was performing particularly some Bach stuff, so we made visuals for that. Um, and eventually, uh, Greg asked me to come back for a project initially, but um, that was 2006, and then I ended up fixed in Toronto, and that gave me the chance to, uh, beside work, focus on um, properly developing um, visuals, basically. So I, again, just did parties at clubs, mostly. Mm -hmm. uh, Stefan Kraus got me again to Germany then to do um, a festival that he did with his uh, Weimar class um, somewhere in Bavaria. That was very nice. Um, but mostly I just did uh, club visuals, uh, did a couple gallery installs with, um, with a friend who had a gallery in Toronto where we did kind of what I thought was fake data visualizations. Mm -hmm. So if you just take random or random found data and visualize it to uh, <laughs> um, create a fake context to it. It was a time back then, like 2008 or something like this, where a lot of these data visualizations came out. And I thought, OK, we just have to, you can make visualizations out of anything, right? You just have to give it <laughs> visual context, then it becomes something. Um, and yeah, so uh, a few years later, I uh, hooked up with um, Madame Mark Thibodeau, who uh, coincidentally, I had a record from them back in 2000 when Canada was really, or well, there was a focus on Canadian music in Germany, mm -hmm. especially in Cologne. Uh, was all like Akufen and um, that beat and yeah. that beat all those people and the Thibodeaux were part of that as well, and then uh, my uh, partner Sherry Kennedy she was friends with them so I got introduced to them as well, and eventually we did uh, Matt and myself did a show that was picked up by Mutech. That's then 2000, I don't remember 2014 or something like this. Mm -hmm. Uh, where um, Matt and I um, did the reclusion show. Um, and that's how I got a little bit more exposure, generally. Uh, I guess I skipped the whole part with Karsten. Yeah, right. Yeah, it's also an interesting topic. <laughs> that, <laughs> that actually started pretty early, too, because uh, they played in Toronto in a pretty small club. That was Karsten... Uh, Carson Nikolai, Olaf Bender, and Frank Brettschneider. Uh -huh, they so toured uh, around the, the three of Raster No Tone. Yeah. Um, and I met them 2008 in that club, and I just um, we just started talking because Leipzig, Chemnitz, pretty close, and mm -hmm. I knew of Carson's stuff. Um, 
and we invited them over to the office. Um, and then Carson invited me to come to a residence down in Florida where he and Olaf had a, a residency. And um, th there we started working on a concept for a show in uh, for CTM, mm -hmm. Club Transmediale here in Berlin. Oh, so that was 2007, and then the CTM was 2008, where we, the, for the first time, kind of showed to the public the interface of Touch Designer as it's now. This is amazing concept, actually. Like it's you looking so nice. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And it was funny because we looked at it and we were kind of, okay, what do we want to do? And then Karsten saw the network and he's like, okay, I want that as my <laughs> visuals. So uh, Selena, our programmer, Selena Siu in Toronto, she then worked on making it possible. And this is still a, um, a secret feature, so to say, we're, we still haven't released this, but um, made it possible to take the network and project or use it as an output, as a full output. Uh -huh. Three screens. Um, and while well, touch is completely controlled, the network is con completely controllable by our T script back then. There was no Python. So you can zoom in, out, change node sizes, whatever, move around the network. And so we scripted this whole interaction and basically created this visual show for Karsten that uh, but this was kind of like the um, how derivative or touch designer then came to public again after quite a long quiet period mm -hmm. uh, obviously that exposed me to a lot of the work that Karsten and Olaf did and I learned a tremendous amount from their aesthetic and how they see visuals as more of a light element in a club setting things like that and I guess uh, it took um, how do you say took inspiration or pointers from them as well mm -hmm. to work on my stuff um, we proceeded then to do three more installations with Karsten which is the uni uh, universe I believe which was um, a collection of uh, time and uh, visual perception based component or uh, visual visualizations that are have the same concept as a show like you have this um, setup of all of these separate components and then it moves zooms in and out of them throughout the 40 minutes of the show um, another one then was Unicolor which uh, just took uh, color concepts uh, perception again um, with a little bit of different like now you have them side by side and they uh, move out of the way for one of them to expand um, and the last one is uni in display no oh wait uni display was the first one uh -huh. uni display uni color and uh, oh, sorry I can look it up um, here we can go to Karsten Nikolai dum -da -dum. works and if we go back du -du -du -du, we find oh yeah there's uni text that's a different one yeah uni text no that's a series sorry yeah, you need display. That's the one. Um, that was the first installation view. Let's see if there's. Just gonna jump a little bit. This was, and I mean, I got introduced to a lot of these bigger venues as well. This was uh, the Hangar Bicoca. Um, I think this is a six projector setup. Back then, done with these awful Matrox triple head. Um, I mean, it's not necessarily awful, it's great because it was affordable at the time, but uh, a little bit of a headache device. Um, then we did, yeah, Unicolor. This piece here. Dum 
do do just gonna skip forward also a little bit they are, I think they are pretty well known yeah, we can even play with music why not it's all the stream it. okay yeah streams with it so really also it's something that I learned there is uh, to take time in installations like let it sit in a way mm -hmm. let, it, let people look at something and then um, introduce a new a new concept to it I found that a an interesting approach. Um, yeah, Karsten was always fascinating me. Like he took amazingly simple uh, ideas and made it brilliant. Mm -hmm. So after that, actually, it's impossible to do something like that anymore because it's already done. It's right. like yeah. okay, he <laughs> he like done a patent for everything that was very super simple. <laughs> <laughs> I mean. Oh, maybe only Japanese artists can do it even better. <laughs> yeah, it's a it's a funny it's it's really funny because you if you look at a visual and you try to make it also satisfying for yourself, I for myself ended up then basically staring at a line at some point and I'm like, oh, it's kind of done. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> this is very satisfying actually. Um, but yeah. Um, and the last one was all oh right uni tape this was an installation in we don't have a video for this this was an installation in Chemnitz Chemnitz has a big textile background uh -huh. um, and so all of these patterns were kind of based off um, uh, I forget the machine uh, Jakar Jakar patterns or just this machine where you put you can basically program um, analog by putting like holes into a roll or something like this. You can create these weaving patterns. Uh -huh. <laughs> and uh, so this was a collection of basically weaving patterns created uh, through uh, um, uh, repeating, repeating. Uh, Okay, so it's, uh, it's easier than I thought because it looks a, a bit more like a uh, cellular of tomato. <laughs> there, there's one here, yeah, exactly. There's one. One of them is a cellular. This one here, I think, is a cellular automata. Uh, but the rest is. There's some MIDI sequences in there as well that are just playing back. Um, and you always have this line here where it picks up the. Um, kind of picks up the current element that's running through ah, okay and that generates also the sound oh, okay wow I didn't uh, see that installation um, yeah this was only installed twice I think once in Chemnitz and once in uh, Korea really nice installation as well really like working on this so yeah I picked up a lot of uh, cues from his work and uh, it's great to be able to um, uh, hang out with people like that and through conversation also uh, learn from them. The other thing is that when you work on projects with artists like this, there if you have a certain understanding in a way, then a concept can be explained to you and then you uh, deliver on the concept and uh, so you put your own interpretation in it as well and if you understand have a good understanding with the artist then uh, it's not just executing it's also creating mm -hmm. stuff. So that was uh, yeah that's topic of collaboration with musicians is always a bit uh, complex can be tricky yeah, uh, yeah. I, I think so too I'm not sure that's yeah because sometimes people have a very strict idea of what they want very particular um, and sometimes they even don't have a very particular idea but they are not happy about what you're doing, what you're doing. but exactly. still don't have like more precise concept so it's like can be very yeah. not easy correct but if you manage to get the same mood uh, same wave shape mm -hmm. that is very brilliant that was literally the uh, there, I was very lucky to have had the opportunity to work with Carson on that because that worked really nicely. It was a uh, no stress environment, um, mutual understanding on things, so um, really nice. Uh, yeah, uh, 
okay so did that um, we did right the work was Matt Thibodeau I mean um, maybe I can show there a little bit For sure project one dot net um, is my website this is by the way also fine ah. <laughs> <laughs> now I got that, <laughs> that name <laughs> But this happened way before we had a project one. <laughs> um, project one was with friends in Canada. The idea to have a website where musicians can, um, that's 2004, 2003, 2004, where people can, um, like you would create something and you would send it off to the friends that were on the website as well. Mm -hmm. And they would remix it and put it back. And so it would be kind of a, collaborative environment environment for people to remix stuff never really happened but uh, I had this website and then uh, suddenly we have a project one in touch designer I had nothing to do with that <laughs> but I had the URL so <laughs> 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 so I just went with it um, yeah there's a little bit of the things that I did uh, earlier on. Yeah, this is one of the uh, um, with uh, for Arthur Oskin, a Canadian um, musician, like early experiments. I'm not sure from when that is actually, but this must be 2008 or something like this. Um, Scanline was an installation uh, for a gallery where I kind of dabbled in in feedback and. Uh, used an image 2009 yeah used an image made by Rui Pimenta he made these uh, um, oil dropping paintings in a way and we scanned those and then just did these feedback loops with edge basically uh -huh. and then did a scan line uh, like one line at a time revealed it and just let it do its thing um, we have and this is very it is very satisfying to also just let run in a gallery setting it creates pretty colors um, we installed it at his gallery at the median contemporary in toronto as two vertical screens that were running um they were just running um let's see this is one of those uh, fake, uh, fake data fake data I found a shopping list of chemicals of a university and this is all the the names here all the town names basically <laughs> and uh, I can't remember what all the other data is but it's random stuff um, random data onto a um, onto a uh, ellipse mm -hmm. to offset it to create kind of a lake shape or something so kind of creating a C map um, with that and stuff animating to it um, yeah uh, data visualization using randomly acquired list of chemicals uh, something that I found with this installation actually was that there were so many fingerprints on the screen because people wanted to interact with it uh -huh. which got me uh, I thought it was interesting too they there was nothing to interact but people tried very hard to do that um, this is another one uh, stock market driven data visualization the uh, yeah again just taking stock data basically and making a visualization out of it was a little bit inspired there by a guy from I think Romania or something he did he took spam emails and created uh, 3D objects out of them. Uh, I recently, I s somehow I learned to some guy who was creating music with uh, Spam oh, from yeah. last month. It was kind of harsh noise, but was funny. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> because he was also printed with <laughs> Python that like output of this uh, source mm -hmm, he used, mm -hmm. and it was like on uh, green and uh, red the yeah. parts of text. And red was used for visualize, <laughs> so it was like funny, <laughs> funny it's, movie. You can, I mean, if you if you take an approach where you say I need to find things in here to create something, then you can. 
Yeah. Uh, you can always find uh, stuff. Uh, I don't think I have a video for that. Um, oh yeah, I did some. I did some audio visualizations. I really like this one. This one is on one of Karsten's song um, tracks. Um, I think it was called. I'm not sure if it's called Counter. But you can find this on my Vimeo as well or on my website. Uh, it's a great eye eye bender in a way. Like if you look at it long enough, you and then look away, everything starts moving. Uh huh. Which uh, it's a very simple concept here. This is just um, grit, like the white lines. The white lines are grit sops, and then I use a. Uh, I use a twist sop uh -huh. and a copy sop and for each copy that's created I use a stamping for the uh, stamping on the copy and uh, it's stamping onto the twist amount parameter uh -huh. the amplitude of the audio waveform mm -hmm. a little bit of shading but it's just like default funk shading whatever and you get then these uh, patterns very nice yeah um, works very well I thought but yeah ultra simple ultra simple concept to it um, it's sometimes the simple things that really get you quite far. Um, da -dum -da -dum. Similar also this year, ausdrücklich. This is using uh, Pensonic, um, a Pensonic track, and it's also just the wave. Waveform and uh, putting the uh, putting the amplitude of the waveform as the normal onto a circle mm -hmm. and then excluding it <coughs> and then turning it 90 degrees. Cool. <laughs> it's, uh, and then some more like harsh lighting to it, basically. But, uh, that's the whole idea here. And that worked very well. Creates, creates quite nice, um, yeah, shapes in there. It's a little harsh, but uh, good. There was also maybe I can find this. I'm not sure if that's just gonna go here to my Vimeo and uh, show a very simple particle, a very simple particle simulation that I did back then. Uh, let's see, let's see, sorry. Sound with. Oh. Okay, let me find it on my YouTube. The track is often, or sometimes you cannot see the, sometimes you cannot see the video because it's being uh, blocked. But let's see, maybe. I think it's here, video. Dun, dun, dun. This one. Uh. Also, a rather simple concept. You take a line with 735 points and again apply the amplitude as the normal uh -huh. to the line and uh, feed that into a particle sub and then control a little bit I think the uh, um, the lifetime with the amplitude again and yeah that's was always fascinating to me that I mean one reason I started to make workshops that uh, I found that a lot of people uh, currently doing touch design are they mostly coming from just top the ground mm -hmm. so have no idea about sops 
and because I was always uh, working with Houdini, then I thought, okay, it makes sense to speak a bit more about that uh, soft stuff, which is, can provide completely different level of uh, ideas. Yeah, totally. Even if it's a bit slower than uh, all GPU-driven stuff, but still. There's a lot there to play around with even now, I think. Yeah. Um, it's again, if you're checking out the Touch RX-17 stuff a little bit, um, there you can see a lot of the... Uh, um, because there were no tops, there were only subs, and uh, so all these all these synths were made just with shops. And geometry. Yeah. And there's a lot of interesting approaches there, what people did um, or created there. Yeah, even in a modern time when everyone tried to make a GPU particles, I recently I've seen some question on, uh, uh, on the Touch Designer Help Group. One guy was asking, is any way to uh, c connect the optical flow to the particle SOP? Mm -hmm. And everyone was answering, it's n not possible, but actually I done it in 10 minutes. So I okay. even recorded some small tutorial about that because oh, it's like, nice. basically you just project <laughs> that on the points as an attribute and then uh, voila, you have it. Works as well. Yeah, yeah same yeah. way. Just then use delete soap to remove uh, points with, without velocity and. Yep, yep. Exactly. It's yeah. It's funny. It's the uh, um, totally worthwhile checking soaps for that. It shouldn't be forgotten uh, that the power that lies in soaps and what you can do with a copy soap, for example, and the stamping in there is a whole world by itself. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, some years ago, I mean, I was started uh, Goudini in 2000. I was start to try 2001 mm -hmm. and uh, I get to work with it 2004 uh, after some friend of mine was basically explaining me a bit uh, the concept of the groups. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then I just realized the uh, amazing power of this approach. Then. Uh, Basically, I sta started my workshops 2008 mm -hmm. about Goudini. Yeah. And actually, it was the time there was no schools, no workshops, and everything I was explaining how to uh, u use copy soap and like <laughs> point soap, so that mm -hmm. those are very basic tools. And it was yeah. a big punch for a lot of people to grow in the career a lot because it's uh, that's easy concept, but no one can really good explain that to that times. Yeah, there's not that many resources, so that's something that you have. Like you have a huge resource there on that topic um, in your tutorials. Yeah, yeah, because I was always orienting on that old school concepts, which are not really populated now. Mm -hmm. So that was the reason I started yeah. everything because I thought, well, touch this. So I even I was uh, not really working with touch until 2012, I think. Mm -hmm. However, I heard, I had a friend who was traveling to Canada. He was working in 3D equalizer, so he was making like matching, mm -hmm. uh, camera matching for, I don't know, for big commercial projects like uh, about architecture visualization. Mm -hmm. uh, and somehow he bought a touch designer license. So I think he was the first guy owning touch designer license in, in Russia in okay. early 2000s. Uh -huh. And uh, he was also using Goudini a bit and he was telling me about touch designer so then i landed to Sila Sveta and i realized how similar is it to, uh, to Goudini mm -hmm. then mm -hmm. i uh, booked uh, Denis Akopov and Dmitry Napolnov to make a workshop mm -hmm. so i had a, like i had a club in Moscow mm -hmm. <laughs> and we were using that club space for making workshops mm -hmm. and then i booked them to for one day workshop and they explained me actually everything what I didn't knew about touch designer during this workshop so I started to work with it yeah oh. then yeah. one day uh, they needed to make uh, some talk for CG event in Moscow and they were sick so they couldn't come and then I decided to make that speech myself mm -hmm. so that mm -hmm. was my mm -hmm. first uh, <laughs> try with touch designer yeah <laughs> That's uh, usually how it works, right? You just uh, try it, eventually it works. Or you get it, get something done there. The, uh, 
um, yeah so I mean it's a lot of it's a lot of stuff here and uh, a lot of it is really simple I'm playing around with just ideas essentially the idea here this is also an installation I did a while ago projecting onto um, onto two by four wood slabs that were painted mm -hmm. uh, in the uh, uh, very simple patterns again that just went on it but the nice thing was when you remove the light a little bit off the wall it suddenly creates a lot of depth mm -hmm. when you like you're also not clear what's happening when you walk into the space when you look at it because it's a little bit removed off the wall but so it hangs a little bit there it's just concepts that are uh, that I'm trying to explore there um, a laser installation down an elevator shaft which didn't do much but very effective and what it did actually it just moved up and down the elevator shaft uh -huh. the laser thing so lighting up the lighting up all the stuff that's in the elevator shaft together with some fog that went up really like yeah very effective in what it did and more it's always just stuff to look at uh, not much is happening in my things um, and eventually I got to this thing where after a workshop at a company they were asking to have all these color proving tools or mm -hmm. or can color analyzing <coughs> like a vectorscope uh -huh. so back then we uh, um, you just had to write a simple um, GLSL shader uh -huh. to move the points in instancing into the color space basically and you can find those tools in the palette as well now using tops for it but uh, it's just a vector scope essentially mm -hmm. but I found that when feeding these with um, tops of like different noises basically um, I can create these interesting um, interesting pattern wow. from it and that got me to investigate in that direction more uh, to use um, tops as as the base data mm -hmm. and then convert it into another um, into another uh, representation um, which then eventually resulted in this performance here at Timber that I did with the Tibidos at Mutech as well a few years ago. So this is the, uh, this is the, uh, what we're called, let's see, that's the waveform monitor. Uh -huh. But if you feed the waveform monitor with the right data and take out the grid, it seems to be broken here, can be fixed. Um, you can create these nice waves almost. Uh, so you can animate this really nicely, this whole thing. But it, um, the input might not look very interesting. So for example, and I can show the real, I think I have the, um, the noise. I do have the real, whoops the file that I was using for that performance but uh, you just start with a 32-bit colored noise um, feed that into here and um, now that doesn't look so interesting currently um, but the more you play with it basically and the more you animate you get to interesting uh, looks in it uh -huh. Uh, therefore uh, chroma for example so therefore the more y you take this as the as your final output and you have to work with th th with whatever you have as the input mm -hmm. um, and the input can be completely abstract and not related to your output mm -hmm. uh, so it does it looks partially it looks really ugly um, I can show you that file as well. Let's see. Do, 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 do. I think that's here. Uh, shows, maybe? Yeah. Timber. 
2017, sure. So now warning, my files uh, for these kind of things are not very, they're not gr structured greatly, just as a FYI. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I usually perform with an open network. Um, I don't have an interface, so to speak. I just have my operators. I know what to connect when. Um, I use a I use touch OSC mostly as a control interface. Mm -hmm. uh, so some things are connected um, to it. Oh, is it still running? I guess so. Uh, let's see. Yeah, now it's obviously now it's hard actually to create something. Let's see. Let's just connect some stuff here uh, or cross see what we get there I guess I can take this as an output turn this off um, let's see I have to find something that is interesting no kind of no stuff basically the container displays yeah all kind of looks the same but I said yeah you're essentially you're creating these kind of um, waveform patterns and control them and for each of them I have small networks that control noises or um, ramps so it's nothing world moving what I'm doing here because I just look at this or I look at the output and try to create something that I find appealing that mm -hmm. might fit to the music um, and with a little bit of work basically you get to um, you get to these kind of um, looks in it I have I have a bunch more. Let's see. I have a nicer one actually. And that's 2017. Uh, how do I get there? Here. Ah, yeah. Like this here is. Uh, it's loading. It's loading. There we go. Yeah, looks completely detailed and very interesting. Yeah, it's almost like water. But uh -huh. Yeah. I think I also want to open the ch if we have some chat questions. Yeah, I, I think there are some people writing us. Oh, audio from that is a little bit loud versus microphone. Okay, so because. Yeah, I can make this a little bit more quiet here, maybe. Yeah, so this is the kind of stuff that you can create, but this is just a waveform monitor in its... Uh, you just have to play with the input enough to actually get to these kind of looks. Um, and... Yeah, so I continued on this path a little bit further by um, doing uh, the next one was then a duo with um, Franz Jobansa saw um, Matt Thibodeau and myself perform at a festival and then asked me to do visuals for her and um, I think we met with her last time in Montreal 2019 I was speaking with her a bit Oh yeah, 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 super interesting uh, musician as well um, and she has this collaboration with uh, Richard Cartier from Los Angeles and then they asked me to do a, a video for, for this project and this is now using the vector scope uh -huh. and yeah, just playing with the, the 
inputs again and making a whole show out of it. Um, this premiered in, at New Tech, but uh, was then, unfortunately, the pandemic kind of got in the way of that show, so we haven't been able to show it again, uh, which is unfortunate. I really would love to actually present that and you get a lot of you get a lot of detail mm -hmm. uh, and it doesn't really translate so well in video that's a problem with most of my stuff compression makes destroys it um, and I guess yeah there's like a nice picture of this um, at a festival in Korea that was the last time we showed it so uh, complex worlds that you can create out of this just the waveform uh, the vector scope blown up so vector scope you usually just look at the center of the mm -hmm. image but uh, once you pull out and move the vector scope a little bit to the side and use 32-bit uh, textures and uh, increase amplitudes outside zero to one you can actually start exploded there yeah, somehow these big things um, yeah and this led eventually to I mean there's more stuff here I did some visualizations I maybe can speak to in a bit but um, this led then to the last thing I did with France which was the um, uh, entanglement um, entanglement performance uh, also for Mutech and following a similar concept of building up building up all these um, it's basically point clouds but built with tops mm -hmm. only mm -hmm. so no shaders involved um, there is a bunch of kind of where I try to do frequency modulation but in tops mm -hmm. and then I have four of those going uh, four of those uh, basically those are ramps then that are being that are being generated and that flows through a whole effect chain to then create uh, all of these different outputs uh, very geometric partially um, and in other it's completely opposite looking uh, very ge geometric with completely geometric uh, geometry avoided yes yeah <laughs> <laughs> but you get these spaces in there like uh, some when when they're overlaying basically you get these um it pulls uh yeah it, uh, rooms almost in there it, it's quite interesting um we discovered more of that when um Mutech asked us to do a VR version of it, mm -hmm. and um, the VR version then is that you kind of look behind the screen. On the screen, you have a little uh, cutout of the, uh -huh. what you see, but if you take the screen away and actually look at everything that's happening, then there was, to our surprise, a lot to discover there and a lot to play around with. Uh -huh. uh, and the process in touch is really easy to set things up as a VR um, um, for VR so uh, that was a really pleasant thing to build up um, yeah so you know I mean to summarize a little bit I mean a lot of these things that I do are experimentation um, this for example is the spectrum top That somehow uh, creates this is for Saele um, Valese on uh, Karsten's label No Tone and he asked me to do two videos for two of the tracks on the LP and yeah one of them is basically what, what looks like flames but it's you can kind of tell that it's the spectrum of the sound mm -hmm. wave but then going through a process of converting this into a spectrum, then uh, playing with the frequency and the phase domain separately, mm -hmm. and merging it again into an image with the spectrum top, mm -hmm. uh, back into something. Yeah, yeah I remember you were strong that on uh, Northern Institute, uh, I think. Exactly, yeah. And uh, it just takes experimentation there, an idea kind of, 
um, always good is also the lens distort. The lens <laughs> distort top is very giving. <laughs> um, yeah, and I use this as well for um, the uh, the video that I did for Camaro um, this spring which is also a spectrum top let's see if that I showed at the node institute here let me just skip through a little bit but yeah compression is <coughs> compression is always my biggest enemy for these things it just uh, kills the detail in it there's uh, tons of color detail in this usually um, it doesn't really come across very well. Best to actually go to the website and look at it a little bit because the the fine lines that are in there and the lights are um, I find interesting. And all of these light things are just created by the uh, uh, spectrum. Mm -hmm. It's not <coughs> there's none of this actually in the file. I think we see a question of Fallon asking if his next gig featuring your work. Um, we have, so we have a couple of gigs coming up, which is um, in Göteborg at the end of October, 20th of October, I think, with Franz. Mm -hmm. um, and then in Dresden at the I think th I uh, this I believe there will be a, uh, we haven't had the full like uh, it wasn't fully confirmed but it sounds like it's gonna happen so in Hellerau there will be a game oh, wow. when uh, 20 I think it's a 29th mm, it's like sounds doable in it comparison to Göteborg it's yes. still not so far but like Dresden here is in the corner is pretty close. yeah exactly so as, so as soon as it's uh, publicly announced I'll uh, post that as well but yeah that was kind of a quick overview I guess <laughs> okay <laughs> so I think uh, if uh, someone so we have like 33 people in chat right now did I ever make a dome mapping mm -mm. no dome mapping yet uh, it's a yeah the uh, entanglement as we have converted it into VR lends mm -hmm. itself very well now to dome mapping um, so that is a Basically, it's not a big distance between uh, DOM and VR exactly. stuff. Yeah, it's kind of ready to go for that. Actually, this one is this one was supposed to be a DOM mapping, but then I found if I if I do it flat, if I do the DOM mapping flat, it's I found it much more interesting. So. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, supposed to be a 360. Ah, okay, it's like the security rectangular coordinates, uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and when you use the project uh, projection top, uh -huh. you have the you have those controls where you can rotate uh -huh. everything. And I think if I if you scroll this video, if you oh yeah, here you can here you can see it mostly. Like you see those lines here, uh -huh. so it becomes clear that this is actually um, this is actually constantly moving. Oh, oh, here maybe a little bit clearer how it's moving in the uh, accurate rectangular. Uh huh. Uh huh. I understand. Uh, yeah. Um, and no, no use of AI. Although, uh, what what interests me is the looking inside the machine. Generally, I, a lot of the stuff that I do is not necessarily uh, created from the get go. Like there's noise in the beginning, and then I try to create things out of noise. Um, might be one more file I like to share. Um, the work. Let's see if I can find this quickly. Du, 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 cloud. 
da, da. where um, nothing makes sense until you see the output in a way. Mad here. This is a really old file. I like the name. Untainted. <laughs> All good projects called Untainted. <laughs> Um, so the, always the idea that you start with stuff and you try to shape it into something um, and so this is a strange network that I used for a lot of uh, VJ gigs where your output is these kind of patterns it doesn't run it runs at 12 frames and the stronger computers get the faster it actually runs i think when i created it it ran at like maybe five frames per second or something like this uh -huh. but because every image is different people make connect to the beat uh -huh. and <laughs> take it as what it is um I remember uh, like 2013 uh, we were doing some installation in art house in Moscow. I was sitting in Berlin and my friend was making locally there mm -hmm. and we communicated over the projection because I was like projecting from, ta I mean I was working on team viewer and sometimes in text top I w was writing images to him. Yeah. That we were making an installation where it was like uh, I think the matrix of uh, 40 motors mm -hmm. i mean not motors uh fa computer fans which were sucking and putting the air inside of balloons yeah so tra trash ca tra trash uh, balloons yep yeah and uh, we were trying to make it interactive by kinect <laughs> but we've been it was before uh, that um, engine for duina came which um, how it's called which can control a lot of uh, mm -hmm. signals in the same moment. Mm -hmm. I forgot uh, how this. Okay, anyway, I was trying to make uh, Arduino program myself, but it was not enough time. And on the end, it was uh, all run on a random basis. Oh, yeah. But people yeah. were coming around and found the connection. Yes. That is actually interactive. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's like <laughs> people's brains work. <laughs> yep. Yeah, you try to see stuff. Um, that's, the, that's the thing, like the brain. That's actually AI. Yeah, it is. Yeah, but <laughs> <laughs> but in real. <laughs> <laughs> and it's so the uh, and this is literally also what interests me. Like I find it really interesting everything that's in between the noise and the final output. So I've got a couple operators here that I can control, and um, the closest the closest relation to this would be uh, when you open up the piano and start and you're more interested in what's happening inside the piano uh -huh. than what's happening outside so this is maybe a, a similar thing and to ai um we saw a performance at new tech uh, that patrick uh, lechner did from uh -huh. austria uh -huh. an ai performance but he was particularly looking not at the outcome from his ai but he was looking inside and the textures is generating yeah, actually yeah. to calculate data yeah yeah <laughs> that's interesting and it's the, and you can yeah become creative with those with those elements i find that very uh interesting and appealing and somehow we managed to come to uh, uh, to new tech residency for ai before covid like literally it was oh, two yeah. two weeks before the full paranoia started everywhere mm -hmm. and uh Fairly to say, I'm not really want to replace my artistic work by AI, mm -hmm. but I found because we we got like a lot of lectures from like best of the best of the best, explaining us what is doable, mm -hmm. and it was a guy I think uh, Mike's Max uh, Frenzel, mm -hmm. he was explaining about some of uh, his uh, engines he done. It was like uh, doing a latent space of samples on his machine mm -hmm. and generating uh, not existing samples mm. where you like have a 2D map of all like here's kick drums, here are like uh, snares and how it would s sounds here mm -hmm. in between mm -hmm. and that machine yeah. was generating. This is like an interesting approach to yeah, yeah. 
yeah. not direct like to make text to image uh, and now a nice picture right yeah that's kind of the uh, I think there's a lot of space to explore stuff in there and to learn how to uh, how to work the machine um, basically yeah we have uh, any file for us Dutch designer followers to uh, well um, what do I have if I publish stuff then um, it is at where do I find most of that stuff I mean a lot of the ideas that I'm still using is uh, let's see you can find a lot in the generative design There's a lot of stuff here. Uh, when the book generative design came out, then we set on to converting a lot of these examples into um, a touch designer. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's also a great place to learn about subs uh, in general. So um, you can find that on the touch designer GitHub. And on GitHub as well, I do have... Now, what's my GitHub called? Snout. <laughs> um, I don't think so. Wait. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me check. I do have a GitHub and I publish some stuff there. Let me find that. Why do I not know what my GitHub is? Oh, I know. There's a link actually on my webpage here. GitHub. That's easy. Who's an architect, right? Ah, yeah, okay. Also, yeah. cool That's name. The there is a little bit, so a bunch of things you can find in SoundWiz. There's a bunch of sound visualizations. Um, and under collection, I believe there might be. Yeah, there's a bit of stuff. I should publish more. Yeah, you're right. I'm always afraid because my stuff is so uh, non organized, like a lot of it looks like this. <laughs> um, but I work for. Which just uh, corresponds to the name of a project. <laughs> 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 and I feel I have to be more structured, but I have to be very structured. You can write, uh, write a script work. to organize the stuff. To organize it nicer, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm not sure that Greg will be happy if you do if you T script. <laughs> True. Yeah, no, I'm not allowed to do T script anymore. <laughs> I have to say so fairly, I still teach a bit of T-Script sometimes. A little bit in there, right? Yeah. yeah. Some things are just not possible otherwise. <laughs> <laughs> but we're not allowed to say it uh, loud, yeah? Nope. But I prefer to teach everything what is ex existing to make uh, everything doable. We are literally trying hard to rid ourselves of it completely, but some things are still, um, yeah. Sometimes it still creeps through. I know, even in uh, in Goudini, they replaced uh, in some parts uh, like uh, HScript by Vex. Yeah. But okay, Vex is also another number than Python. Mm -hmm, still, mm -hmm. it's much easier to write stuff with Vex than okay. with Python. Yeah. It's more. It's uh, much faster. It's yeah. more compact, and mm -hmm. it's. Uh, I mean. Python is a nice uh, uh, representation of English language, mm -hmm. <laughs> but it's not that efficient, yeah. like Vex, which is much more similar to GLSA, I think. That was a change, but yeah. Even which, uh, simpler. Yeah. What is actually really missing in uh, Touch Designer, some kind of language which can have that like high level functions oriented to work with geometry. Mm -hmm. I mean, even the JLSL uh, doesn't have that much mm -hmm. of things like near points, uh, yep. uh, all that stuff, which uh, really, really improve uh, Houdini mm -hmm. workflow. You know, sometimes, I mean, if you write your own uh, uh, Vex wrangle, it works faster than the Houdini operators itself. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That is uh, still, uh, I mean, I'm. Uh, personally, I love working outside of scripting because I tend to, my scripts tend to become so huge. Mm -hmm. I'm like, uh. But yeah, they have also that VOP environment, which is amazing. I mean, for people who are not into uh, not into coding but still need that uh, possibilities, 
uh, it really works very well to uh, make the coding visually. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And something like that would be really great also. Um, kommt Zeit, kommt Rat. Uh, how do you, I don't know what the English expression would be, but uh, um, a little bit of patience, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, uh, in some time I was uh, preparing, actually it was just, I was preparing a talk for Touch Summit in Berlin, mm -hmm. and somehow in one night I made a, a collection of uh, geometry shader functions, mm -hmm. and on the end I remember it was almost like I developed a VEX for Touch Designer yep. in one night. Yep. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's still not really um, uh, finalized, but uh, I use it myself in my own uh, work. Right, yeah. Um, because now I, instead of writing this ugly big uh, geometry shaders, I just write a very simple mm -hmm. uh, functions which can like create tube yep. and it's like generates tube around the edge. That or one, something yeah. like that. That is nice. Reminds me of uh, Tommy um, Atkins Ray TK network as well, uh -huh. uh, or uh, framework, which is operators or components, but every component representing uh, a function in a ray SD casting. Uh -huh, yeah, SDF yeah, stuff. SDF stuff, yeah, exactly. So I think the approach is always, or we try always to get. I mean, Touch Designer is a visual programming platform, so as close as we can stay to that. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah, that's. Uh, I mean, We're after I started to do it, uh, how to touch course. In some moment, I realized that there are a lot of people coming, expecting that like they just could be an artist without any understanding of programming. Now, unfortunately, it doesn't work completely. Mm -hmm. But for, on the other hand, uh, programming itself is based on very very simple logical structures yeah. and doesn't matter if you do it like with coding with python with c++ or just with operators you have uh, to have in mind that's five uh, st logical structures you can use for everything mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. i started to make uh, so my course starts now with a long lesson about basics of programming in any environment and that's idea yeah, yeah. it's the medium that you gotta find Mm -hmm. But uh, the knowledge is big. you need to know all of them, uh, or you really succeed if you know all of them and then know how to mix them efficiently. I think. So. Yeah, on the, on the first level, I think it's most important thing to work efficiently with any programming uh, platform is just to be able to express your task with simple English or corresponding right. Russian, yeah. German, whatever language, mm -hmm. where you can transform uh, all verbs to the operators, mm -hmm. <laughs> or like mm -hmm. all, uh, all verbs to the structures and all simple words to the operators. Yeah. And actually it's very easy. Yep, that's true. Most problematic point to structure it in your head to be able to pronounce like that. Formulate it pro yeah. properly. Yeah. That's funny, that's a little bit how these uh, text to image AIs work. Yeah. yeah. If you can, if you know how to express yourself, then you can get uh, to the... Yeah, basically we were speaking some years ago with Vadim Epstein, who will be actually, so here I can an announce the next uh, guest for person in touch in two weeks uh, and he said after he started to research a lot that uh, think about uh, AI and especially text to image uh, he started to be really um, disappointed by people <laughs> because this looks very very similar <laughs> to how us works <laughs> so I think we have some me more message I don't understand what means RCP, red, cold peppers. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a reference to, I think that's uh, rapid control. Uh -huh. This um, something that the V4 people created, which is a protocol to uh, talk between machines or different, different programs uh -huh. and allows like you have ah, a yeah, like RCP server, like, uh, okay. Yeah. Um, I think that's what uh, Simon means. 
it's like you can have a, you can create your UIs on web browsers, uh -huh. or you can um, one. Basically, one program is advertising its controls to another program, mm -hmm. and then the other program knows what to do with it or what can be done with it. Um, context, I don't know. I was suggesting, uh, suggesting RCP to get to your GitHub. <laughs> yeah. Oh, right. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's a good search item there. Um, I don't use any other tools in my pipeline now. I just, yeah, terrible, right? But um, I mean, th the best way to test the software is just to use it. I tried for the uh, VR thing. I tried a little bit Unreal, but uh, found that I just cannot express myself the way that I want to. So um, after trying for, I think that was, that was a long time, like five months that I was digging into Unreal but I couldn't get to the same, like what I wanted to do. And then I just said, okay, no, forget it. Um, if you have a tool that you can express yourself, then why not just keep using that? So, yeah. Yeah, Felon offers us to use blueprints. Mm -hmm. They are super powerful. And I really liked actually a lot of the blueprint features that are there. There's a lot of stuff that we can learn also for organizing um, or uh, like working with different data types, stuff like this. So I enjoyed working with blueprints. Um, but yeah, yet again, I just the output didn't satisfy me at all. But this is totally based on personal approach, yeah. what I wanted. And uh, therefore, I just went back to touch designer. I completely uh, agree that there is amazing stuff out there like there's i've seen such great unreal projects as well real-time uh stuff it just yeah sometimes i if you can't express yourself then it's kind of useless for me yeah i mean uh, touch designer i think is very known for be very flexible and very mm -hmm. fast mm -hmm. to do stuff yeah so i mean all other programs somehow takes either too much of your uh, mathematical, uh, mathematical imagination mm -hmm. or too limited to some particular workflow mm -hmm. and still I mean Houdini and Touch for me is like only the tools where I can be like flexible yeah even if it costs sometimes more time to achieve a very photorealistic result yes yeah but uh, you save a lot of time on other sides that's yeah, there's definitely th those kind of things I encountered uh, in Unreal. It's really simple or much more simple to create interaction, for example, in VR. Mm -hmm. And it takes some thinking to do this similar interaction in Touch Designer. Um, and this is those kind of things where we have to work on, like how to make stuff easier, accessible. Mm -hmm. because like why would you need a render network and render picking and stuff like that to do a simple interaction in uh, in VR in touch designer there should be a more straightforward uh, way to do that but um, yeah so it's great that there are so many tools out there that do so many things so well yeah, yeah. that's true Good to know them all. Uh, only so much time. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's unfortunately also true. <laughs> yeah. So some uh, more questions from uh, our friends online. The Omniverse create. I haven't checked that yet, so I have no opinion. It says uh, Simone. I think. Uh, it's a very uh, intense and active person studying currently in uh, also in how to touch nice and yeah he he started from the first lesson to render some stuff using omniverse and this looks amazing wow. so even i started to install it yeah in the uh, hope i will find the time to learn a bit but yeah it's like i think it's more commercial style of visualization in mm -hmm. real time in comparison to unreal yeah 
Yeah. And like also USD based, so it's like uh, very fitting in like traditional VFX pipeline, mm -hmm. but for real time approach. Um, yeah, Simon, I mean, uh, you're in Berlin as well, so I think we'll meet up anyway. Uh, last time I was here, I met up with him. Mm -hmm. and looking forward to seeing you again and see what you've been up to. So, yeah. Yes, Oak is something that I'm super happy about. This is kind of the, uh, what feels to me, uh, not sure anybody, everybody knows Oak are these cameras uh, made by Luxonis, a company out of the US. Mm -hmm. um, the backstory to it is that the guy tried to make a camera for his bike to detect or warn cars when mm -hmm. they come too close to his bike or something like this. Mm -hmm. And what came out of it is a camera that is essentially a machine learning coprocessor. Mm -hmm. So not only does it, um, not only does it uh, machine learning uh, processes for the camera that's attached, but you can also send it your, like you program it and then you send it images or you send it sound or whatever and it's doing it on the camera, mm -hmm. which I think is ideal. Like the, uh, if you use the Kinect Azure, for example, your, uh, it takes up a lot of processing power on your machine, mm -hmm. which is something that I rather have available for what I'm trying to do visually. Mm -hmm. So this camera offloads that. Uh -huh, onto yeah. the it's more like a DSP approach for, for sound. I guess so, yeah, yeah, exactly. The, uh, and you don't even need to send back the image then from the camera. Like if you're just tracking people in a space or something like this, you don't necessarily need the image. Mm -hmm. You just need data where they are. So then you send over network just those positions or the data you need. I think we will open the page. So we're currently working on implementing uh, creating a framework to use these cameras. It will be a lot of Python code. They have a Python API and you have to create those uh, frameworks yourself. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of example frameworks though that they have already. Um, a lot of the models that are available um, online can be used on it. But it's a Python heavy, Python heavy approach, yet it does complex things. So it's a little bit complex to set up just the diversity what you can do with it is huge yeah. really excited for this uh, should be a few more months but uh, until we have something but once we have this uh, they're also great uh, because they come as a PoE version mm -hmm. um, which makes it ideal for installations you can just run them put them anywhere mm -hmm. just run a network cable and cool uh, um, no drivers necessary, you just plug them in, so the pot switch them, it's like, it's... Cool resource, yeah, and actually first time hearing to that, so it's like amazing. Yup, yeah. And this new camera that's, um, I'm not sure if it's fully available yet, this one, uh, it's a stereo depth plus color plus uh, um, a laser dot projector in there as well. So, yeah, great stuff, really good. Cool. So I think uh, I should make some announces too, because yeah, we just started that. Um, that oh, can yeah. I say one more thing? Yeah, sure. I forgot, Tommy Atkin will be with Ray TK on in session next week uh -huh. on the 23rd of September. Uh, at 3 p.m. Canada time or 9 p.m. here. Okay. It's which day? Uh, Friday, 23rd of September. Uh huh. So, just to, to mention that, uh, should be really interesting to learn more about Ray TK. That's, yeah, that sounds amazing. Um, so, some announcement from my side. So, first one that uh, we are starting now that. Uh, I have no idea how to call that format what we're doing right now. Like, 
let's say video podcast or mm -hmm. uh, talk show <laughs> doesn't matter <laughs> so anyway inviting uh, cool interesting people doing interesting stuff artistically and technically and uh, next uh, person will visit uh, us will be Vadim Epstein I think is uh, very old school person working in VJing. He was a main uh, VJ in Kazantip, which was the first uh, huge rave on the sea coast in uh, Ukraine since uh, I don't know how many years. And it was like a huge crew of German VJs visiting that festival too over, over him. Also not only German, but it was mostly like uh, V, 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 v people mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and uh, then recently he started I mean not recently already like around 10 years he researching uh, machine learning and AI and reached huge results with that and uh, yeah I mean we also preparing a course with him together See, it's also yes. like long long time uh, conversation between us so I think uh we have to uh, make an announcement that uh, in two weeks precisely we will make a person in touch too i'm not sure that page yeah page is ready so we will have the same time it's already available for join he even made his own uh, text-to-image uh, engine since years already called a Fantasia. Yeah. Which a producing fantasy. a bit psychedelic results, but okay. also very, very cool style. Nice. So completely different from uh, Midjourney or mm -hmm. uh, Daily or whatever. Yeah. Stable diffusion, but he also like uh, using a lot of stable diffusion stuff and whatever. So, and another thing I want to announce that in nine days we will run a next how to touch course so it's still possible to join so it's it like is. it's uh that course is a bit monster because it's f starting from six months uh, grown until uh, 10 months now but currently we are thinking in order to ma make it comfortable to teach for everyone we should to extend that program for one year precisely because yeah i mean there are people with different uh, timing in their lives and some people want to have uh, super hardcore timing for workshops some people are just busy with their regular tasks mm -hmm. so we decided we make we need to extend a bit but I mean, it's a really special course uh, because we try to bring touch designer and Goudini and cover all possible uh, questions. So that after that course, you can be really flexible all rounder who can make uh, complex 3D graphics uh, as well as interactive installation with, I don't know, media servers, whatever. So it's like all round course. That and is really uh, enticing. If I, um, I want to take that. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. <laughs> so I mean, we still, uh, still, uh, from that nice diagram, we still a bit on researching on that part with Unreal and uh, Touch Engine for Unreal, mm -hmm. because it's not super well documented, but it will be covered anyway on the end of the course. Nice. Yeah. So that's all from my side too. So if someone still have some questions, welcome to ask. Otherwise, we will slowly finish. Yeah. Uh, we will publish that recording on uh, my YouTube channel. Nice. Good. And also on our website. And yeah, thanks so much for having me. Yeah. How long you stay in Berlin right now? Till November. Oh. So maybe after I come back, so I come back in two weeks to Berlin, we can make some uh, unofficial uh, meeting with yes. everyone. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Like, I think Felon is also in Berlin and Simone and... This is well, exactly. Yeah, that some would be nice. A couple of my other students, so yeah. we can gather and have some beers. Good. 
and I have to run to the washroom. Sorry. Okay, <laughs> thanks a lot, and we finish for now. That was a sudden stop. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, some uh, question about the stream quality. Um, it depends on internet in my house, so maybe I will try next time to make it over my mobile internet. But uh, anyway, uh, recording will, uh, is uh, produced locally, so uh, the quality of recording which will be so good like on computer. But thank you for the question. Okay, uh, thank you for everyone who found time to join us. And I have to <laughs> show my face again. And uh, yeah, thank you and goodbye. See you in two weeks in another stream. So um, I, I think I will post the link to the to join the next streaming in the chat. And I will left some time in that uh, go to meeting application for everyone to copy and say cheers and bye. <laughs>